Um, our next panelist, um, lucky for us, will not be talking about the use of raw data, um, <laughs> and probably lucky for Patrick's blood pressure. Um, <laughs> but she has um, a really a, a different um, and equally valuable um, point of view and um, history of experiences in human rights documentation. Um, she, let me just give you a little bit of, of her bio. Um, for almost 10 years was the human rights director of an organization called Justice Now and was previously with an organization that you've heard mentioned um, over the course of the previous sessions, uh, WILD, or the Women's uh, Institute for Leadership. Um, Women's Institute for Leadership Development, Development for Human Rights, WILD for Human Rights. WILD for Human Rights. Yes. <laughs> um, sorry, we left that off there. Um, but she's had a particular focus on the rights of, of women and girls and women prisoners um, and has some very interesting experiences to share in that context especially um, and in using a, a participatory model of collecting stories and um, you know, personal experiences and evidence of um, human rights conditions, um, including in prisons. So Robin, I don't know if you wanted to stay seated or to take the podium, whichever you prefer. not have PowerPoint. That's fine. <laughs> By the way, that's not PowerPoint. I'm oh. just saying. <laughs> See, this is how ignorant that's, I am. That's LaTeX made into PDF. It's open source software. Just saying. Yeah. Yeah. I am, you know, I am actually, I'm so ignorant with all of these things. It's kind of really funny because I married an economist, at which point I was like, okay, now I never have to worry about numbers ever again. Um, and uh, so to some extent, I, I will not be talking about raw, raw data specifically or using raw data, but this is actually going to be a little bit of a conversation for those of us who can't afford to hire a statistician, right? And one thing that I will highlight every once in a while, and I'm glad that Patrick said, is that one thing is if you end up using something that looks like raw data or you're ending up, this is the most important thing in doing human rights or in doing social justice work in general. Be clear about what you do know and be clear about what you don't know. And I think that's something that we fall into that trap fairly often. And that's one of the things I like about human rights documentation because it kind of forces you to step out of that, to not do that, to actually be clear about what you know and what you don't know. Um, okay, and so I know you've spent like a day and a half talking about human rights. And so what I'm gonna talk a little bit about, about human rights documentation and why I feel like it's the backbone of human rights. And um, I've been doing this stuff for about 20 years now and coming from a woman's human rights uh, background. And so what we're working with, there, aren't, there isn't usually that many numbers to actually pull from. Um, and so, um, and I'm gonna jump back into that a little bit, but what, what I wanna say is that you wanna prove that a right has actually been violated. You wanna prove that a right exists and then it's been violated. And, the, and there's a lot of different ways to do it, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about those ways, but the most critical thing to remember when you're doing documentation is three things. Identify the violation. What happened? What was the human right that was violated? You have to be kind of specific. Was this the right to family? Was um, this the right to be free from discrimination, right to education? Um, and I know some of the rights I'm talking about here are not um, legally held up in the United States, but um, I'm just tossing out um, you know, a bunch of rights. <laughs> um, the right to privacy, right to freedom of information, et cetera, et cetera. What's that right? Who, vi who identify the violator? Right? And that's a really key piece that sometimes we forget in our social justice work, is we're like, gosh, that was really terrible. And um, you know, we didn't say who did it. And in human rights, as I'm sure you've heard, it always has to be the government who did it. And they can do it through their action or through their inaction, through, looking at a, through having a stack of paper on their desk and never so much looking at it or never you know, paying attention to it. So action or inaction. When you're dealing with war criminals or people in prison, the, the government connection's fairly easy, right? If you're dealing with issues around reproductive justice or um, around right to family or right to privacy or um, right to cultural identity, all those pieces, the, the government connection might be a little bit more nebulous and you're gonna have to take it, take it there. Um, and so you wanna make sure you can show that the government should know 
and that it should have done something about it. Um, and I'm, I guess I'm trying to think of an example. I mean, the clearest example is like right to vote, right? If the government knows that people are beating the crap out of other people two blocks down and not doing anything about it, that's a violation of the right to vote. If the government knows that some businesses aren't letting people get out in order to vote, that's a violation of the right to vote. The classic example that was used to actually really start the women's human rights movement was domestic violence, right? Um, the government wasn't beating the crap out of these women, but the government wasn't doing anything about it. Um, and so that's an example. But you have, to, you have to connect it back to the government or else it's not a human rights violation. And then here's the most important thing that I think, again, social justice groups kind of forget. Identify the remedy, right? What do you want them to do about it? Yeah, it sucks, but what do you want to be done? And it has to be a remedy that can actually be accomplished by the institution you're asking for it from. Um, that's another thing. Sometimes we're like, they should do this, and it turns out that actually the Department of Health has no control over that. It's the Department of blah, blah, you know? And um, so, so you want to know what you're talking about. And how do you do those three things? Documentation. It's doing your research. And um, so I'm going to just say, again, a little bit, I'll give a few examples of why I think documentation is important. Beyond those three things, which if you leave this room with nothing else, then please pay attention to your numbers and understand them. God knows. And hire Patrick if you've got a war criminal. Unless you have a war criminal. Yeah. Uh, or hire a statistician. You know, go to, go to Berkeley. They've got millions of, of uh, PhD students who might be interested. Um, is those three Ps. Identify the violation, identify the violator, show the remedy. Right? But so why these things are, and I think Patrick showed a few of those things, but a um, few of those reasons in sort of talking about it, but I want to pull them out because I'm assuming you're all here at this conference because you want to use human rights, and I think because you want to, you know, you work in some broad concept of social justice issues. So I find that people don't take us very seriously when we talk about stuff. They don't think we really know what we're talking about because, you know, we're always railing about something, especially in the Bay Area. Um, so you want to put you want to put credibility behind what you're saying, so that people take you seriously, right? And then um, sometimes you may know what's really happening. You may have a pretty good idea, sort of the example that Patrick gave, and you just really want to back it up. Sometimes, and this I think is more common, we know something's wrong. We don't know exactly what it is. And I'm going to kind of keep coming back to this example, but this is, I worked with women in prison. And we started getting these phone calls about a lot of hysterectomies happening in prison. And that seemed odd to us. We didn't know exactly what was going on, but it seemed like a disproportionate number of people were getting hysterectomies and ophorectomies inside. And so we had to go in and do the research on that. And so that's some of the things. And, and you know, you have to go in and you have to start talking to people and find out why exactly did this hysterectomy come up? Get the med ordering the medical records. Start trying to figure out what's going on because we can't go out saying um, they are sterilizing people in prison all the time or else we're going to sound crazy doodle. Um, and it turned out we actually sounded that way anyway, even though we were right. Um, and then another one is you want to, again, get your facts straight because things are usually more complex than you think they are. Um, one example is sexual abuse in prison, which we did a lot of work on at Human Rights Watch back in the day. And it turns out that there's a lot of sexual abuse of women in prison, but the majority of that sexual abuse is not guards using physical violence to rape women, right? That happens. But it was actually a much more complex spectrum of activities of using force and power to sexually abuse women, right? It was a lot of trading shampoo for sex. We needed to actually know what that was um, and be clear about that every single time, even though the paper is going to write about what they want to write about, but be clear about what we're talking about so that people know that we do know what we're saying and understand. And because then the policies can be made to actually address the problem, which was largely using power and threats to get sex. Um, or another example, to go back to Bosnia. When the, when the rapes were first happening in Bosnia, there was a lot of talk of 20,000, 30,000, just, just ginormous numbers of women being raped. That was not correct. And that really set back a lot of the efforts to deal with the real problem of sexual assault in Bosnia because people were using wrong numbers. So you'd never want to be in that situation because it's going to take you a long time to come back from being flat out wrong. Um, and then also, it can test our own assumptions. Um, when we were um, doing work at Wild for Human Rights, we wanted to look into um, 
teen pregnancy amongst Native American youth and how that, um, how that was leading to na young Native American girls dropping out of, um, of high school, and that was a big problem into the right to education. And the um, tribe that we were working with said, you know, um, we really don't want you just interviewing our girls. We want you to interview our boys also. And we said, all right, you know, because we were doing this as a partnership. And when we went in, it turned out the girls were being pushed out at age 15 or 16 with teen pregnancy. The boys were long gone. 11 or 12 were being put into saying that they were part of gang um, problems and put into homeschooling, which meant they weren't doing any school at all, which gave us a much more interesting, beautiful look at how gender stereotypes were playing out to take away the right to education amongst Native American youth. And we wouldn't have gotten that if we hadn't gone in there and actually talked to human beings. So, um, so those are sort of um, some of the reasons. And of course, the other one is that you want your remedies to actually be good. Um, because what the right remedy seems at first may not be the really the right remedy once you actually go in and start talking to people. Um, so that's one of the reasons why, those are a few of the reasons why I think it's really important to go in there and document. Um, okay. I'm trying to zippity do here for this because I know that the question and answer is going to be the really fun part. So what are our tools for documentation? So I come old school from Human Rights Watch. So Human Rights Watch, their first and foremost tool of documentation is interviews and really comprehensive interviews. Um, and going in and interviewing people who have, have been um, experienced the abuse. And I can't emphasize that enough. Interviews are one of the most powerful human rights tools. And they have to be really good interviews. And Patrick kind of talked a little bit about some of that piece, like it can't be like, and 10 other people, right? You have to be, we don't, I don't know how many of you guys are lawyers, but there's, we have the no hearsay rule, right? You have to directly experience what happened to you that you're telling, telling people about for two reasons. It's always a lot more comfortable to talk about the human rights abuse that happened to somebody else than the human rights abuse that happened to you. Right, but we only need to hear about the human rights abuse that happened to you. If they start saying, you know, and then my friend's uncle, the police caught him and he blah, 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 then you say, you know what, I really would love to hear about that. Can you please give me his name and contact information or can you see if he'd be willing to talk to me? But I wanna get back to what happened to you when the police stopped you on that night and just sort of keep steering it back, but there's no hearsay rule. They have to talk about what they def de um, definitely experienced themselves and no leading questions. Um, did that happen because you were black? You know, you're going to A, get a yes or no answer, and the answer is gonna be yes, right? You're not gonna get the depth of information that you want. Don't ask yes or no answers because you'll get a yes or no, I mean, don't ask yes or no questions because you'll get yes or no answer, and you don't want that. You wanna have, these are my, like I always tell my students, these are the questions that your whole interview sheet should filled with. What happened next? Um, how did you feel about that? What specifically did he say? Can you give me an example? Can you give me some more specifics about that? Um, okay, why do you think that happened? How did you feel? You know, keep getting that, and that's gonna get you the richness of what you need to kind of really unpack what happened. Because because it happened because I was black. Well, even, that, and, and if they say it happened because I was black, why do you think that? You know, and then you get some specific language that actually gives people, they understand, you know, because he, you know, they said I was a black beast and there was like, things crawling all over me and you know, they ever thought I was dirty because I was black, you know? And they kept saying that. Then you're like, oh, okay, that's awful. You know, and you get the words. And that again brings it to the other thing. I don't need to tell people this anymore because we all have digital recorders, but verbatim, verbatim. Um, I don't want to hear what you thought she said. I want to actually hear what she said. And if you have to, and I go, I still go into prisons where they not so much for the digital recorders. If you have to write it down, or, you know, and also in dealing with women who've experienced abuse, I always ask ahead of time if they're okay with me recording, because some aren't. Then and be, be, write it down verbatim and take, you know, and, and apologize beforehand. I'm gonna try to take your, I'm gonna make sure I have your words exactly correct because I wanna make sure that I'm bringing your voice into this. So I may have to stop you, I may have to ask questions, I may have to ask, have to ask you to slow down. But please, you know, it's because I really want to bring your full voice into it. So definitely apologize ahead of time to do that. And the same thing with the recorder. If you have to use a recorder, explain why. It's because you wanna make sure that their voice is heard fully. Um, and check yourself because you will, you will find yourself going into paraphrasing. I've been doing it for 20 years and I will start doing it and you just have to like check yourself, stop, take a breath, go back because you need their voice exactly. Um, okay, um, other, do other things, government documents, numbers, statistics. Many of us are not gonna have the money to run those numbers ourselves, right? 
So Bureau of Justice Statistics has some good numbers. Pull some of those numbers up and, and, you know, and be clear, right, about what we know what we don't know. Because some of the numbers we're going to use is going to be like, they're going to be, it's going to be raw data. I'm so sorry. But you're going to say, out of the 50 women we spoke to, 40 experienced this, right? And so you have to be really clear. This is what we got. This is who we spoke to. This is what we have, right? And then you back it up to the extent that you can with some hard numbers, right? And if those hard numbers conflict with what you found, you got to be clear about that because someone's going to call you on it. So don't play around. I cannot emphasize that enough. Surveys. We use surveys a little bit inside prison. Again, it's not like ideal, but it's sometimes it's going to be the best that you have. And so you can use some surveys. Um, a lot of people doing participatory documentation use surveys, and I'm going to talk about that really quickly in a second. But in schools or amongst undocumented populations, it's sometimes it's a good way to get like a lot of information and sort of how people feel. And then to the extent that you can, follow up and interview those people, right? Um, photographs really powerful documentation that we don't use enough, right? All this stuff is documentation. Photographs, if you're talking about um, homeless youth, a lot of pictures about how they live, that really brings it home to people, right? Videos, again, the same thing. Um, letters, testimonials. That, again, for working inside prisons is something that we use a lot. People send us letters. And that's a valuable way of getting the words in and getting the thoughts and the experiences in of folks that you may not be able to reach, either because they're geographically inaccessible or because the prisons make them inaccessible. Um, and so that's a really powerful tool. Um, songs, spoken word, oral history. Um, we use a lot of documentation for, for, for previous things from um, using songs, spoken word, oral history. I don't think we should ever um, discount that. And there's a lot of communities and places where that's going to be really powerful and you're going to want to pull it out and um, you want to use it. And so, and so that kind of tells you a little bit about, um, and then like I said, there's also many ways to use documentation, right? There's old school Human Rights Watch, the report, right? I wasn't meant to bring it. It's like a, it's a doorstop. Um, and it's compiled of interviews and, um, and documents and government information that we've gotten, interviews with people who've experienced the violations, interviews with advocates who work with those people, and, and this is super important, I'll get to in like five minutes, interviews with government officials, right? That's the report, right? And I think whatever human rights thing you do, you should always um, talk to government officials, and I'll get more into that. But you know, it could be a long report, it can be a short report, it could be a 10-page report, right? bigger chance that a legislator will actually read that. Um, and, um, you know, but you want to have, that's, that's a nice way of doing it. Hearings, tribunals, we've done that. That's a really nice way of doing it. Again, you have like a five or six people, and they're going to talk about their experiences. And you can have handouts that kind of give the stats and information to back up what they're talking about. But that hearing and tribunal is a really nice way to have people's voices heard. Again, I really think you should be very careful, though, about that. First of all, make sure people aren't saying things that aren't true. And, and um, second of all, you know, make sure you're not exploiting folks, right? This is not like a, a, a dog and pony show. This has to be something that's really has to be the folks who are up there. They're sharing some really important, intense pieces of their lives, right? We have to make sure it's done respectfully and that they're doing it because they really want to make a positive change and they're taking ownership and agency over the situation. Um, it's, uh, and then another thing I like is um, exhibits and multimedia. I always talk to folks about that when they're like, we don't have enough money, we don't have enough time. I'm like, well, why don't you just do an ex a, like some sort of piece? Um, and we're talking about, um, these folks were talking about juvenile justice in California and how many of our youth, quite frankly, are in, like, and I mean youth, like 9 to 14 year olds, are in solitary confinement. And we're talking about why don't you build like the cell the size of where they are and put pictures up around of these people who are in there and some of these pieces and then have like, you know, them telling you know, what it feels like to be in there. Have people able to hear, like put earphones on and hear their voice talking about that or read pieces about it. And that's a really powerful way of human rights documentation and really bringing people in there. And you've written up there like, you know, how big this cell is, what the human rights standards are, what's going on, right? But also people get to feel the voices and feel what's going wrong. And um, so, and another version of one thing, I, and I actually did this, Voice of Witness, which is right located here 
in um, San Francisco, um, one of Dave Egger's big, like, you know, empire, um, is uh, this, <laughs> I love him to death, but does he not have an empire out here in the Bay Area of social justice? It's amazing um, and great, but it's huge. Um, so it's a, a series of books that looks at human rights violations through oral history. And so it's a collection of oral testimonies. And we did one for um, women's prisons. And so it was like 13 long oral testimonies and then a really thick appendix, which then gave the meat of what like the facts and the, and the um, stuff behind it, but it was all oral testimonies before that. All right, so that gives you a wide variety of things. I think you should go forth and prosper on that. Um, a little bit one thing um, that Lisa mentioned, I, I also do between those two spectrums, I've done participatory documentation and I think that's really the wave of the future. And that is working with the folks who actually have experienced the violation together to decide what you're gonna document how you're gonna document it, and then to actually do the documentation. And that's how we did the Native American youth thing. At Wild, the way that we did it, was we partnered with different social justice organizations. Um, and we would work with them together to, um, to document the abuse. And, um, and so we partnered with that Native American group, and we also had partnered with um, equal rights advocates to look at abuses um, amongst, um, this was the welfare to work time, just to age myself a little bit more. Um, and looking at how um, abuses, particularly of Spanish-speaking women, were occurring in the welfare-to-work um, transition. Um, and so we did that partnership. And that's a really nice way to do it and sort of to partner with a human rights organization to do your documentation together, right? That's a way of levering, leveraging your contact with um, the people and, then, and their expertise, or vice versa, if you're a human rights organization, partnering with a local social justice organization is a great way to actually make sure that you know what you're talking about and that you are gonna come up with a remedy that actually helps the people that you wanna help and that you're not exploiting anyone. Um, at Justice Now, we, take it a, we took it a step further and because we work with women in prison, we actually did all the documentation together with women in prison. And, um, and, that was, and that was, that's been really amazing. We trained the folks inside on human rights abuses. We talked with them about what human rights abuses they were seeing and then they would tell us what they wanted to, um, what they, what they, I'm sorry, I'm like, I know I'm really, talking too much, um, and they would tell us you know, what they wanted to document. And, and that was really powerful. And one of the things we did was we're, we started seeing this hysterectomy thing. We're like, we really need to get into this and start looking at how prisons um, are, um, are taking away destruction of reproductive capacity inside prisons, looking at the way these hysterectomies are playing out, which again, was not playing out the way one, of, one would have thought, but was definitely playing out, unfortunately. And one of the things they said was like, you know, what really breaks me up are the girls in here who are never gonna have the opportunity to have a child because they got in here when they're 16 and they're gonna be in prison until they're 50. And it never in a million years would have occurred to me to look at that. And that's actually something that's very, you know, we actually, that was something that was data driven and we had someone look at that, which is the number of people that are in there throughout the reproductive years and the way that our, um, you know, three strikes and intensive drug laws were playing out, people were being in prison flat out throughout the reproductive years. Never would have occurred to me if I wasn't working in partnership with a person inside prison who had been hearing this and had been seeing it. And that brought a really powerful sort of secondary element to that research um, and really played out nicely. Government element, I'm gonna be quick about this. Always talk to the government to find out what they think. Um, this is A, important because you need to do that, it's your job. Um, you need to find out why they think this is happening. You need to give them the opportunity to tell you why is this human rights abuse happening? What are they doing to prevent this human rights abuse? You know, you can't just go out there and say the government's doing nothing without actually asking the government. It may turn out the government is doing nothing, but, you, but it may often turns out the government's doing a little something, you know, it's just not adequate, or the government's doing something that's making the situation worse. You have to talk to the government. It's really ups your credibility about a zillion. Right, and then a lot of times you get really, and you should try to interview them. They, they may actually meet you and talk to you. Um, in the prison world, they really don't talk to me at all, um, but they used to um, <laughs> when I didn't do work in prison. <laughs> um, but you know, especially on sexual assault or domestic violence stuff, they will talk to you, or reproductive justice, they will talk to you. And, and two things will happen, or a few things happen, you'll definitely find out what they think they're doing, you'll find out all the information, and sometimes they will say like the most awful stuff you've ever heard in your entire life. And, and that's kind of wonderful in its own way, because um, it totally makes your report much better. So you definitely wanna talk to them, because it's surprising how many times they will actually say something really bad. 
um, which is great. And, and you want to send questionnaires. Um, I, I have a great story that I'll tell if, if anyone wants to hear about it involving Ted Koppel and that. Um, but, um, and questionnaires, you said, a lot of times they'll be like, I can't talk to you, I don't have time. Then you type up your questions and you send it to them. And sometimes you'll get like really interesting answers. So we were doing a report on maternal um, you know, pregnancy care. And we're sending it to the California receiver because California's prisons are in such a crappy position that they have to have, they have a federal health receiver. And we sent it to him. And right at the end, because we had started to work in the structure of the reproductive capacity thing, like, are women offered tubal ligations after giving birth? We just stuck that on there, like last minute. Like literally it was like five minutes before we sent it out. I was like, you know, let's put that in there. I just want to know. Holy crap, they were. You know, and he just admitted it. He just said, yes, we're offering tubal ligations to women after giving birth, um, which is, you know, I won't get into it. It's not okay. Um, and so, but they just said that. So now we have that in writing. And in many ways, that was actually more powerful than the public records request that we then did. Because the public records request, it takes like, and so I'm saying like, don't, don't go, your first movement should not be to the FOIA or the public records request. The first movement is just to ask. Ask for an interview or just ask for a questionnaire because you're gonna get a lot more information that way. And because the public records request takes forever and a day and, um, and half of it's redacted and the other half you don't understand. So, um, you know, because we did end up doing that and we have gotten some information out of it like 12 months later of cross-checking and trying to see, okay, if this date here and this date there and oh my God, you know? Um, and we got valuable information out of it, but um, that receiver saying they were doing tubal ligations was probably at the end of the day more valuable and eight million times easier. So, you know, that's it. <laughs> Thank you very much.